This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, Episode 44. This week, we continue our aircraft series with a discussion on an attack plane loved by friendly ground troops, feared by enemy forces, hated by Air Force brass, and revered by its pilots because of its most distinctive feature. Yeah, there's a lot of airplanes out there that do have guns, and a lot of them are put on either as an afterthought, sometimes even a gun pod if the plane doesn't have a gun built in. Sometimes it's, okay, how are we going to put a gun on this airplane? Let's find an empty spot and do that. The A-10 was kind of different. It, It was a big, giant gun, and how do we strap wings onto it? It's time to strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jello, and we will get to the interview with retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Luke Fricky. But first, let's say hello to retired U.S. Navy Commander Brian Sinclair. What's up, Sunshine? Hey, Jello. Not much. How are you these days? I'm doing great. I'm down in Fort Myers, Florida today. Fantastic. How's the weather? Uh, well, I haven't been outside yet, so uh, I'll go check it out. But it was pretty muggy when we got here. How's San Diego? As perfectly boring as ever, so no complaints here. <laughs> Good. Well, how was your spring break, buddy? It was great, man. We stayed local, took the girls up to, and my wife, obviously, up to uh, Knott's Berry Farm up in Anaheim area and had a blast up sure. there. How about cool. you? What'd you guys do? Well, I drove my Mustang over to a shop in New Mexico and stopped at the in-laws winter getaway in Phoenix and spent a few days there just hanging out with family. And yeah, we just had a good time. It was nice to take a little break. It was, man. A well well-deserved break on your part. And uh, should we get back into it though? Well, yeah, but before we do, I want to say that the little intermission episode we released on our break was actually amazingly well-received. First off, it had the best single day downloads of any episode we've released, even better than the previous record holder, the F-14. Wow. And I, yeah, I attribute that to the fact that our audience is continuing to grow. But what really warmed my heart, Sunshine, you probably saw the comments too, was on Facebook when we announced the episode, we said, hey, everybody, we're taking a break, you know, but here's an episode with some listener questions. Everybody to a man and woman said, hey, enjoy some downtime, enjoy your family, you know, take a, take a break, you've deserved it. So that, that's just good to hear. The listeners are really on our side. They are, man. Thank you very much for all those comments. We sincerely appreciate it. And so do our families. No doubt. So Sunshine, we have a new voice on our bumper announcement. Who is that? That's my good buddy, Clint Bell. So he's uh, he's got quite a velvety voice, doesn't he? He's a great, great he American. Does. So yeah, he and I uh, just met each other through our kids going to the same elementary school. And he's a big time auctioneer and he does a lot of voiceovers for radio. So he's just, uh, and, uh, just a great American. He's a uh, very much an aviation enthusiast. Cool. Well, we're glad to have him on here. Sorry, Jim, you're fired, but we got <laughs> and uh, no, you're not. We'll we'll bring him back and forth. But Clint's got, like you said, a great voice. And does he do work for other people? Is there a way we can help promote him or give his information out in case someone else needs voiceover work? Yeah, Jello. So if anybody interested can go over to ClintBellProductions.com. That's Clint, C-L-I-N-T, B-E-L-L productions, all one word.com. They can take a look at his uh, portfolio of his work of what he's done in the past and what he can do for our folks in the future. Cool. Well, we will leave a link to that in the show notes and we are glad to use his services here on the show. All right. Well, before we get to the interview, as always, we have some quick announcements and then some listener questions. And Sunshine, you always like to ask about Patreon. Let me just beat you to the punch. We're going really well. (laughs) We've got several new strike leads this week. Talbot McInnes, Standing Cow. Love that one. Standing Cow. Scott (laughs) Meek. Yep. Not falling or sleeping or anything else. Or Mad Cow. cow. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. That's right. Uh, Scott Meek, Sam Rivera. I've been practicing this one. Let's see if I can get it right. Nicholas Mark. No, I can't. Hold on. Nicholas Marchi. Marchigiano. Nicholas Marchigiano. That's right. There you go. See, <laughs> no, it didn't matter how much I practice. You start the microphone. Aiello. Isn't Aiello Italian? What's up? Yeah, but I'm used to that one. <laughs> anyway, Robert Evans, 
and uh, we've got a new division lead, Gustavo Kampf. And we have a guy who started off as a strike lead. I was going to announce him as such, but before we got to recording this sunshine, he turned himself into a mission commander, and that is the $50 level, and that is Magpie, another good one. We'll put him with Standing Cow. Excellent. Great. New uh, folks added to the Patreon cadre, and uh, especially love Standing Cow and Magpie. I'd love to hear more about that. That's right. Well, we'll have to figure out what's going on there, but... All right, what do you say we do some listener questions? Sounds like a plan. So the first one here is from Jacob Meltzer, who is a Patreon division lead. He says, Thank you, Jacob. He says, based on the F-14's fleet defense mission, and even with current aerial threats to the fleet today, is there or was there always a fighter or two ready to go with air-to-air missiles equipped in case incoming threats loomed large? Are fighters generally considered the first line of defense against aerial threats to the carrier battle group? What do you say, Jello? Well, the second part of that question is definitely yes. Uh, The first part, Sunshine, you probably remember this too. It really kind of depends on where you are in the world. So as we get closer to countries that are a little less friendly, we tend to stand different alerts. And I feel like we talked about this on the show recently, but you have different alert statures or... Postures. Postures. Thank you. That's the best word. See, that's your superior education. And and so depending on the threat, you can have different levels where you are even sitting in the aircraft on alert seven, ready to go all the way to, hey, you just have to be somewhere on the ship ready to go within an hour or two and everything in between. And yeah, you the aircraft or two will be loaded with live weapons and they will be ready and you can jump in when you're told to, and off you go. I mean, what more is there, Sunshine? I don't want to give away too much of our tactics either. Uh, no, true. Absolutely, yeah, and we like to work in sections. We're very social creatures, right? So uh, groups of two, excuse me. Okay. Why don't we take a phone call next? Hi, hello. My name's Josh Martin. I live in the San Diego area. And my question is, have you or have you had any friends or people that you got to know that were on the flight line, like the Ordies or the Yellow Shirts? Did you really get to know any of those people or, you know, there was that just not a relationship that was built. Uh, I was, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, do you guys ever get in a relationship with them? Do you ever get to talk with them or do you have friends that were on that, on the deck, uh, even the list, enlisted men that you got to know? Thanks. And have a good day. Bye. All right. Good question. Josh from San Diego, right here with us there, sunshine. What do you think of that question? I think it's a great question. So I feel that I had very healthy professional relationships with all the maintainers, whether they be Ortiz or the guys working on the seats, the AMEs or the, the mechs working on the engines, the 80s. But there, the Navy does have very strict doctrine, we'll call it, that prevents us from fraternizing. And the fraternization is basically prejudicial to good order and discipline. And it's what they call unduly familiar relationships that can cause some issues within the Navy. So yes, we have great working relationships. I'm not going to call him Frank. He's not going to call me Sunshine, but he'll be 81 and I'll be Commander Sinclair traditionally. And then, uh, but you know, we're just very amicable folks, obviously. And they're very, they're very proud of their job. I'm very proud of mine and I respect them for their job. And I, I show that in my in our relationships when I talk to them by calling them by their, their rating, right? So, hey, 81, can you come here and help me with this? Now, when you fast forward to a port call, something like that, you see them out in town and you're in civvies, they're in civvies. I would traditionally go over and kind of buy the first round or have a drink with them and chat with them. And then I'd move on, though. So I just don't to so that uh, you got to manage perceptions, right? So you don't want to have your skipper seeing you. Uh, kind of teeter-tottering on that brink of fraternization in the uh, in port calls. So you kind of have uh, just enough of what relationship, I guess you can say, to keep it professional, even when you're out of uniform. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, well handled. I would say to Josh's question, I didn't personally know the yellow shirts very well or any of the ship's crew. I mean, you, you cross paths with some of them. And like you said, Sunshine, you're, you're friendly, you're professional, you're cordial, but you have to always know that line. And you don't want to single one person out and become particularly friendly with them, particularly if you are of mixed gender, because then there's the assumption that there's some other thing, relationship going on or whatever. But you you could just keep it professional, but it doesn't mean you have to be standoffish. And I, for one, didn't really get to know the yellow shirts that well, but I'm not as outgoing as you are, so I bet you knew everybody on the ship. <laughs> and, uh, and for me, what made it interesting was 
if you lived near somebody, or in my case, I have a nephew who we were both in the same command. Yeah. I was an officer and he was a petty officer. And so he'd come over to the house and we would be family. And so we just kind of had that agreement. Hey, when we're here at the house, you know, it's just John and Vincent. But when we are at work, then, you know, we have to defer. And, and people know when you're related and you just you just try to avoid, like you said, that undue familiarity. But when you're family, I think there's some expectation. But what it really comes down to is you don't want, when the time comes, any preferential treatment, as you said, for when reviews are given. So in other words, Sunshine, if you were in charge of the maintenance department and you went and bought everybody around and you were friendly with them, that's one thing. But if you were particularly friendly with 81 Smith and then fit rep time came around, or I guess they'd call them evals, 81 gets the number one from you as the most talented petty officer in his shop. Well, the other 81s or the 82s might complain and say, well, hey, Sunshine was fraternizing. And so that's why we try to avoid that. And I know you did a good job of that. Likewise, Yellow. I'm sure you did, too. So good call, dude, on the especially yeah, the yellow shirts. I did. Uh, I didn't go into the yellow shirt locker there very often. That would be the, the kind of their assembly area in the island. But uh, when I did, it was usually start off with a smile, end up with a question and then a handshake. So they're real nice folks up there. Oh, yeah. yeah, so. yeah, usually everyone yeah. is. I mean, you always get someone who's grumpy one day for whatever reason, <laughs> pretty much. All right. You want to take this yeah. last one? Yeah, sure. So Rolanda from Guatemala asks, how important is the rudder for ACM? Is it required for some combat maneuvers? And is it different for the F-18 versus the F-16? He notes, in flight sim, most folks don't use it very much, but maybe they should. Jello, what do you think? Well, in flight sim, I've only done that once, and I don't know how you could possibly get the feel in it because it's just it's more artificial and you don't have the seat of the pants. So, yeah, I don't know about that one. But great question, Rolando. I would say it's very important for certain maneuvers. I mean, to your question, we have a maneuver in the F-18 called the pirouette where you can't do it without the rudders and you have to get to a certain airspeed, certain angle of attack, and then you have a certain maneuver you can do with the stick and rudders and it almost swaps the aircraft end for end and it can allow you to point at your adversary very quickly. I found it was much more useful in the F-18 than the F-16. Sunshine, I guess you probably didn't get to BFM the F-16 very much or at all, did you? <laughs> at all, correct, okay. none. All right, so that aircraft doesn't like to get slow. It likes to stay fast and get its energy back quickly. So in the F-18, once you got slow, which is where the rudder is useful, then you could use it to sort of start the roll in the direction you want to go. So if you wanted to roll left, you could start with a little bit of rudder and it would help you get going. And then when you were slow, it was the best thing for rolling for reasons we've talked about before on the show as far as slow speed flight and our previous deep dive. So yeah, it was it was pretty important. And it's one of those things where like any specialty, you start off with science and then it becomes an art. Dogfighting, as we, Sunshine, you and I have not yet talked about as we record this, but hopefully by the time people listen to this, they will have heard our next deep dive on ACM. But it becomes an art as you get more experienced. And the little advantages you have from experience, like using the rudder, can really make a difference in a dogfight. Uh, what do you got to add to that, Sunshine? Uh, so Jello, excellent, excellent explication there. So with a pirouette, yeah, I'm totally with you. So the Hornet, you remember back when they had the falling leaf mode? So yeah. the Hornet, the, the Hornet software engineers became real sensitive to and very, did a great job of solving the, or let's see, installing a lot of departure resistance. And for me, a departure is going to be a stall and a yaw. So what I mean by the stall is high alpha, obviously. So you're thinking about the longitudinal angle, you know, alpha, and then the, the yaw is going to be your beta or side slip. Well, the, uh, the flight control logic in the Hornet really tries to minimize that side slip, that beta, especially at high alphas. Just like you said, that's, that's departure resistance. Now, but then when you do put in a boot of rudder and lateral stick in the same direction, below 225 and between about 25 and 40 alpha, uh, unclassified numbers, you can actually remove some of that logic so it allows, just like Jello said earlier, allows for that heading reversal, if you will. So mm -hmm. if you're going nose high, you can swap ends if you will, to a nose low kind of a attack. So love the hybrid, or the pirouette, excuse me. And then the hybrid is also another maneuver used specifically in the Super Hornet. And it's a similar idea of high alpha control and they introduce a lot more beta command, I would say, or uh, directional control, if you will. So rudder to flip or swap ends and kind of get into uh, ditches and whatnot. So mm -hmm. 
Other than that, Jello, when you did uh, rendezvous, did you ever use the rudder at all? Um, sometimes just to like do a cross control, which if you already had your speed break out because you were closing too quickly, it was just a way to fly an unbalanced flight. And in doing so, you created more of a profile to the wind, and then thus you had more drag, so you slowed down more quickly. So, yeah, a little bit of cross control, but generally that wasn't the, the preferred technique. Again, it was something that came with experience, and you certainly didn't want to do that if you also had a wingman flying off at you. Yeah, great call, man. So the hockey stop rendezvous, as we, I think, used to yeah. call it. And that, that's not that's not BFM, obviously. It's just during the admin portion of the flight. But, yeah, yeah I would uh, I would kind of tickle the rudders there, too. And as an Echo guy and a Charlie guy, a single seat, I knew the y'all was coming. And y'all is kind of, I think, uncomfortable in the plane. But if you know it's coming, it's no big deal. When I started flying with Foxtrot and uh, Deltas and had a guy in the back and test, uh, I would do my hockey stops and they're kind of like, uh, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> so I kind of had a, a y'all alert, let's call it, who was okay. organic sitting in the back seat. Yeah. So anyway. All right. Well, when you first said a stall and y'all, I thought you were suddenly from the South. We got a stall y'all, but, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then you threw out, you, you threw out some numbers, uh, the 225, you said the 20 to 25 alpha, but the 225 was the speed, right? The knots. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No problem. I, it's easier for me to hear the things you're not saying and, you got to do the same for me, buddy. That's why there's <laughs> two of us. All right. Well, Let's... that's probably going to do it for the questions. What do you say we get to the interview? Great idea. I am excited for this one. Yeah, this is a good one. So we call it the Thunderbolt 2, and we're going to do that on the titles of the show because we want to be technically correct. We'll see that on the next episode. We'll have two. But yeah, we'll see that Luke Supa Fricky and all his buddies call it the Warthog, and we'll find out why. And before we get to it, we just want to announce quickly that we have another thematic giveaway that will be of interest to our DCS players in the audience. Five copies of the Enemy Within 3.0 campaign created by our team member Baltic Dragon will be given away. You can find the link in the show notes, and we will promote it on our various social media platforms. Well, with that, Sunshine, I say we get right to it. Let's go. Today, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in Phoenix, Arizona, and we are joined by retired United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Luke Fricky, call sign Supa. Supa, what's up, bud? Hey, thanks for having me here. Well, thanks for coming. You actually drove up from Tucson to do this. Yeah, sure did. It's not too far. Well, and here's the other props I want to give you, dude. I have an email from you from June, no, February 9th of 2018, not long after the show came out. You reached out offering to help, and we kept in touch, and here we are a year later. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Well, we're glad to have you on the show, and we today are going to talk about the A-10, which is one of the aircraft you flew, but let's hear about the others and you. Where are you from? What did you do in your military career, and what are you doing now? All right. I uh, was born in Chicago, raised there, and then I went to college in Michigan Tech way up north. Uh, I did Air Force ROTC, got my uh, commission through the Air Force that way, and then uh, went off to pilot training in Texas. Uh, I went to Wichita Falls, which is a Shepard Air Force Base, an international pilot training program. When I graduated there, I stayed as a T-38 instructor in what's called a FAPE, first, yes. as, first assignment instructor pilot. We've had that acronym on the show before. Oh, awesome. Okay, yep. So I did that for about three more years after graduating, and then I got selected to go to A-10s. So I moved to Tucson, trained up in the A-10, and then shipped out to uh, Korea for a year, Okay. Uh, unaccompanied, and then came back to Tucson and spent more time there flying the A-10. Uh, got to see great places in the world like Afghanistan. And after that, I went to Texas, to San Antonio, Texas, to teach in the T-38, which is the aircraft I was a FAPE in. Okay. So now it's teaching uh, instructors how to be pilot training instructors. And then I got to go back to the A-10 for two years. Took my family with to Korea this time. Uh, got to fly an updated version of the A-10. And then for my last assignment in the Air Force, I went back to that same T-38 squadron that I was in before in San Antonio. <laughs> so you just been kind of bounced back and forth between the same couple things for most of your career. Yeah, I, I feel real fortunate. I got to fly for 20 years. Um, oh, wow. You never took a break? Ne never took a break from that. And it was great. It was awesome. Really good. I'll say so. So how many total flight hours? Uh, just about 5,000. Wow, man. 
Incredible. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, today, while we could talk about the T-38, I'm guessing the listener might be more interested in talking about the A-10 Thunderbolt 2, but that's not really what you guys call it, is it? What do you call the A-10? No, it's the Warthog. Well, why is that? I mean, come on. It's kind of beautiful. <laughs> Pretty early on in the history of the uh, A-10, it got the uh, Warthog nickname. It's a uh, slightly asymmetric, lots of stuff hanging off the wings, things like that. It uh-huh. got it got the ugly... Uh, reputation pretty pretty early on but ugly in a beautiful way i oh, would yeah. submit but Absolutely. we'll get to that all right well super you know the deal here we've got all these questions as we talk through our aircraft series but dude screw all that let's talk about the gun <laughs> <laughs> sure i mean come on everybody wants to hear about the gun let's just start there because i think that is i mean correct me if i'm wrong didn't john boyd basically design or whoever he was involved with this aircraft didn't they essentially design this aircraft around the gun yeah the, you know there's a lot of airplanes out there that do have guns and a lot of them are put on either as an afterthought sometimes even a gun pod if mm-hmm. the plane doesn't have a gun built in And sometimes it's, okay, how are we going to put a gun on this airplane? Let's find an empty spot and do that. The, the A-10 was, was kind of different. It, it was a big giant gun and how do we strap wings onto it? (laughs) Uh, yeah, it's the Gow 8 Avenger, 30 millimeter, uh, big Gatling gun. I guess Uh, technically it's a cannon, right? Somebody needs to explain to me the difference between a gun and a cannon, but we're going to call it a gun people. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. It shoots about 60 rounds per second. Uh, so it, it packs quite a punch, carries a few different types of uh, ammunition that you could use in it. Mm-hmm. The gun itself, you've, if you've seen pictures of the A-10, it s- sticks out the front, big seven-barreled uh, Gatling gun cannon sticking right out of the nose of the aircraft. And just as proof that the airplane's built around the gun, if you look just directly down the front of the airplane, you'll notice that unlike most airplanes where the nose gear is right you know, down the center, right mm-hmm. underneath the nose, it's actually offset to the side. Because the gun took priority. The gun's there. So they just move the whole nose landing gear assembly off to the side to make way for the gun. Uh, The barrels go back about eight and a half feet. And then it's connected to a big gun drum for ammunition. And there's chain belts and all, all all the mechanics that make the thing work. And that goes pretty much all the way from the nose of the aircraft where the barrels end all the way back to right at the front edge of the wing. So it's the whole front half of the airplane. Um, and the gun itself is, I think, offset a little to the left, but that's because the firing barrel is basically right on center line. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, so there, there are seven barrels, mm-hmm. and the one that shoots is in the 7 o'clock position as you're looking at the gun. And that barrel is right down the center of the uh, aircraft, so there's no asymmetric pushing one wing or the other wing. <laughs> and the whole everything else surrounds that one barrel that's shooting. And how many rounds can you carry? A typical load is 1,150 rounds. Okay. And what's the firing rate? About 60 rounds per second. Okay. So, which is a bit slower than the M61 on most of the fighters, which is only yes. a 20 millimeter, about 100 rounds a second. But yes. 60 rounds a second is still pretty formidable. Yeah. And you alluded to the different type of rounds. Are we not allowed to talk about the different no, types? No, we, we can talk okay. about the different types of rounds. Because I know there's some, what, issue with the depleted uranium. Yeah, and I've, I've never shot that round. Um, okay. So, yeah, there's the three types. The one almost everybody shoots most of the time is our training round. Sure. Just a big old 30 millimeter steel slug. Um, it's huge. You've seen them, right? I oh, yes. I should have brought one. Oh, they're enormous. Um, yes. So they're really big, and it's just a steel slug, and we use them like it's, it's a 30 millimeter TP round. Sure. It's a training practice round. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that round is more armor piercing than a 20 millimeter armor piercing round. Wow. Just because of the mass behind the mass, it. mass, yeah. Because it has that mass, it also means that although it's coming out the barrel a little bit slower than the 20 millimeter, and I don't, I don't, I can't recall if the those numbers we can even I, talk about, I, but it, it probably doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, so. we assume that the 30 millimeter round is coming out the barrel at about 3,000 feet per second. Okay. And we just assume that all the way down. Hmm. Um, it probably comes out a little bit faster, and at the end, it's a little bit slower, but not much. It's You're so massive. About the TP round in this case, or just all of them? All of them. Okay. So um, for your ballistics, they're, they're slightly different. Okay. They are slightly different, but not much. Okay. So for all of our, you know, timing and when we're gonna pop and when we, when, sure. when we have to pull off target and things mm-hmm. like that, it's all based kind of on that. We don't have to worry about the bullet slowing down if we shoot it at further ranges. So I know there's some other aircraft that need to get inside of a certain range so that their high explosive rounds can fuse, or if they go outside of a certain range, the bullets can start tumbling and go subsonic and then they lose accuracy or even again, the fusing thing. We don't, we don't really have to worry about that. We can shoot pretty far out. So if I'm doing a, like a high angle strafe from, you know, medium altitude, I'm going to open up somewhere around 1.5 mile slant range, Mm -hmm. which, you know, is 
just a straight line the from the target. The yeah, the hypotenuse, will, yeah. Right. I was a math major. Uh, there you go. And if we're doing like low altitude stuff, we'll maybe, you know, we got to get in really close to the uh-huh. fr- to the friendlies. You know, the bad guys are really close, so we want to get close to sure. really have good fidelity and accuracy. Then we'll shoot maybe about a mile or so. Um, okay. Uh, and so our range is good. The energy is good. So, okay, that's the training round. Right. Um, the other round that I've fired is the HEI round, so 30 millimeter HEI, high explosive incendiary. Excellent. So think it blows up. And it lights stuff on fire. If I remember correctly, it's got like a little disc inside and it lights, like you yeah, said, lights things. Yeah, it's like a zircon things. ring. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you study, you know, you, you're you're way into studying all specific weapons and threats and all that other stuff. So you study this one and each of those HEI rounds, when it hits, it fuses and it blows up like a hand grenade. Right. And there's a certain number of fragmentation, you know, metal shards that go flying out. Right. And so we know the distance that they're going to fly out and the probability within a certain distance that they're going to hurt people. Jeez. And then that, there's that there's that zircon ring in there that also lights stuff on fire. So anything right. within a certain distance that can light on fire will. And then you shoot those from, say, you shoot from like a mile away. All of your rounds are going to land within maybe a 50 to 60 foot circle. And 80% of your rounds are going to land in about a 25 to 30 foot circle. So it's real concentrated plus accurate right? in a, sh- a small CEP, as we've described before. Right. So show. if all you right. put that and sp- spray down a whole bunch of hand grenades that are all exploding and lighting things on fire, there's not much left inside of there. No. So you're going to use that for different types of targets. Those are smaller explosions, and it's small little pieces of metal frag. So that's not great for armor, but it's good for softer targets, mm-hmm. uh, enemy troops, uh Smaller vehicles, things yeah, like that. Lightly armored vehicles, troops in the open, aircraft in the open, perhaps yep. radar yeah, systems, light, light skinned exactly. things. Yeah, um, and then the other round is one I haven't fired because I've never been in a theater where we've needed to use those. Just where I have been, I know A10s have shot it before, but it's the depleted uranium round, and that is very similar to the training round. It's a big steel slug, and inside of it is a little rod of depleted uranium. Wow. So it sounds all horrible and radioactive. You could lay in a bed of those, and you wouldn't. You, it's you get radiation from the t- sun. Table just table salt. By the pool. Table salt has more radioactivity that right? than okay. this depleted uranium stuff. The bad part that uh, there's been pushback on with those type of weapons is, let's say we go shoot a bunch of tanks with it, because that's what this is for. Uh, this is for punching through armor and a lot of armor. Okay, like twelve inches of armor, so it can hit a chunk of metal. The steel is going to provide some momentum and start to push apart the armor a little bit, but that depleted uranium rod is so heavy and dense that it's really going to push through. And then when it also hits, it's got a property that it, it kind of liquefies and turns molten, oh, and gosh. it just goes shooting through armor. A tiny little hole, punches through the other side. Bad things happen on the inside of the tank. Well, in the aftermath of all that, what you're left with on the outside of the tank is a hole where the bullet went in, and then there's white powder around it, mm-hmm. and that's got the residue of the depleted uranium stuff, and that's the powder you don't want to breathe in. Oh, okay. Because now you've got low order radiation, like for the rest of your life in, in your, your lungs, lungs, and that's okay. that's bad. So right. that's as much as I know about it. I don't know all the details <laughs> or any of the controversy. Right. I just know there's been some pushback, okay. not just on the bullets, but other type of weapons that all have right. that. But I've never shot that because when I was in Afghanistan, we didn't have armor uh, as one of our targets, so we didn't okay. use it. All right, dude. Well, that's awesome. But I guess to be fair, we probably should go back to the top here and get back on subject with the aircraft and the questions in the order that the folks are used to. So with the A-10, what was it designed to do? And I think we've already touched on that a little bit, but what was the point of the A-10 originally? Okay. So the point of the A-10 is close air support. So just CAS for short. Okay. And I'm, that's probably another one you guys have used. Oh, yes. So it stems out of the Vietnam War where... Uh, by that time, the Air Force had gone completely to fast jets, um, swept wing, Mach 2 aircraft uh, to fight a different type of war. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves in a jungle war trying to provide close support to troops. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very difficult to do in a plane that has a huge turn radius, goes really, really fast, is meant to deliver to deliver tactical nuclear missiles, something like an F-105, you know? Mm-hmm. And that that's the type of plane that they were using for close air support in there, with some exceptions. You know, they had forward air controllers flying smaller aircraft. Right. And they OB-10. still had the A-1 Sky Raider for a little while, I think, oh, which man, was helpful. Oh, man, that thing's awesome. <laughs> if, I was, if I was born a generation earlier, there that's what go. I would want to be but in. But anyway, um, all right. So we lost a lot of aircraft in Vietnam, 
And specifically, the F-105 is built by Fairchild Republic. Um, man, they built, I think, 800 F-105s, and something like 550 of them were lost in combat. Wow. So that company specifically answered the call when the Air Force said, hey, we got to do CAS better. How can we do that? Because... Um, it's a problem. It's a weakness we've had. We've lost a lot of airplanes doing it because these fast guys are coming in low trying to do it. They're not as survivable. And coming in fast, they're they're having a hard time finding the right target, understanding sure. the, the the operation, what's going on on the ground. And so they, they had a competition for like they always do for new airplanes. And uh, one you know, uh, who, who built the other one? I don't know, whatever. The A-9 was the other one. Okay. And then the A-10 was built by Fairchild Republic. And they uh-huh. went to school. They lost all these airplanes on the um, on the F-105. They said, well, what did we lose them for? Oh, hydraulics. One bullet can hit a hydraulic line. The whole plane's going down. Right. So let's build redundant hydraulic systems. Let's build a manual reversion system so guys can get out of, at a minimum, get out of bad guy land if they get hit. Let's put in fuel tanks that don't explode. Let's do uh, all sorts let's of things like that. Let's, let's separate all this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Protect the pilot. You know, we're sitting in a big armored bathtub. They right. call it the titanium bathtub because they realized right away they would need to make a survivable aircraft because in order to do this cast thing, what was envisioned was to get in the battlefield, have a long time overhead, loiter time, mm-hmm. and not be going super fast, fast enough to do your job, stay away from threats, maneuver, right but slow enough so that you can actually orbit over the battlefield, talk to the guy on the ground and understand what he's telling you and see where the good guys are, where the bad guys are, things like that. The problem with that is you're going not very fast right over battlefield. Right. And there's, you're going to soak up bullets. You're going to soak up. Your, people are going to try to shoot missiles at you. Sure. That. So you have to build this thing real survivable. So it's a flying tank, man. Yes. Um, we, we always felt really confident, um, You know, in Afghanistan, there wasn't a a huge threat from the ground, but Mm -hmm. we'd get the, hey, you're getting shot at every once in a while, which usually meant guys were spraying their AK-47s up in the air at us. And we were just, oh, man, I want to find some bullet holes. And we never, (laughs) uh, when we were out there, we never did. I'm sure some guys have, but our our, our squadron didn't because we're like, yeah, bring it on. I don't don't care. You're Mm -hmm. not going to do anything to me with that. I think in Desert Storm, there were some pretty famous stories of people bringing back some pretty badly damaged war dogs. Desert Storm. There was in Kosovo. There was okay. in Iraq Part Two. Uh, okay. There, there was, um, and and several airplane uh, uh, airplanes were lost um, in Iraq both times. Really, um, we haven't in, uh, had any in Afghanistan. Um, Knock on wood. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Co- Kosovo. We made it through Kosovo. We lost an F sixteen and an F one seventeen, but right. the A tens did all right. Uh, not for lack of trying. No, oh, I'm sure. Um, so that, that was one of the things. Let's make this thing survivable. So how do they do that? Well, I mentioned a couple of them. We got the armor for the cockpit. We've got the redundant hydraulic systems. If you look at the A-10 picture, you got two big motors, and they're not right next to each other like a lot of fighters have. Mm. So if one motor explodes, and I'm talking catastrophically explodes, like right. movie-style explosion, the other motor's fine. They're, they're several feet apart, blocked by part of the fuselage with more armor in between them. So that was done on purpose, separate the motors. If you also look, you've got those two motors and you've got a uh, twin tail uh, mm-hmm. design with the, with the tail of the aircraft. And the exhaust part of the two motors, they're up high, is kind of shielded. If you were to imagine looking at uh, an A-10 flyby, sure. you've got the tail, you've got the blocked. horizontal the mm-hmm. horizontal part of the tail, and then the two, the two vertical parts of the tail kind of blocking the exhaust of the engine. And and what's the tactical significance of that? Well, what comes out of the uh, hot end of the engine? Well, hot, very, very hot gas. Infrared signature. And Mm -hmm. infrared seekers can find that really good. So those type of motors are this, shoot, they're the same ones that are on some of the old uh, Canada regional jets. And the S3 Viking, as we talked about on the previous episode. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same motors on that. So it's already doesn't have as high a a thermal signature as like an F-16, an afterburner or something like that. Um, but now you're hiding them just a little bit more. So okay. they, they do things like that, uh, design them. And, you know, what else looks different uh, well, we're from not... other fighters, you know? Yeah. Oh, well, we can get yeah, there. We're getting, we're getting ahead a little bit because okay. we'll talk about why it looks the way it does. But we can leverage on this discussion. Sure. But uh, to your point, it was designed to be a close air support for the folks on the ground and essentially a flying tank. Yep. Now, that being said, our next question is, what is it good at? And I think I know this one, even though I never flew it, but it's pretty darn good at what it was designed to do. Yeah, it's purpose-built 
for one thing, mm-hmm. uh, that close air support um, role. And yeah, I mean, I, I felt real confident doing it. Um, well, it, I, it, it excels at uh, what it was yeah, designed yeah, to do. I, mean, I don't think there's uh, any way around no, it. I mean, no, it has, it's good. as we'll talk about in a moment, several mm-hmm. weapon stations with diverse weapons available. It yep. has the protection you talked about built into the design, which is wonderful instead of afterthoughts. And so, yes, I, I would say it does. You know, I don't know where else to ask this, Supa, so I'll ask it here. I remember around Desert Storm 1, they were trying to get rid of the thing back then, and they're still trying to get rid of it. What is it that people hate about the A10? Uh, let me let me show you a uh, let me show you. Well, remember real quick. this. I know they're not, I know they're not going to be able to see it, but I got okay. a patch, and it says treason bird. Okay, uh, yeah, it's treason bird, and it's got a picture of an A10. <laughs> okay, um, there's a long history, really, from when the A10 went operational to till till now till today. It's still going on in a lot of circles. Um, I don't know how to say it right. Okay, so the A10 community, oh, it's typically laid back. Mm-hmm. Guys are good at their job. They're real passionate about it, but pretty laid back and not, you know, not, not, it's got a different reputation than some of the other, uh, uh, I don't want to call out any, any other uh, <laughs> communities, but it's just got a di- that sort of thing. However, one of the things about the community on average is we got this huge chip on our shoulder. Because it's always been like, ah, we don't really fit in the Air Force because it's not. It doesn't look like other fighters, and it's not fast and pointy. Should almost arguably and, be an army aircraft in a sense. Y- yeah, but there's there, that goes even that, further exactly. back in That's history. A whole yeah. Separate. Mm-hmm. So this chip on our shoulder is probably way bigger than it needs to be. But you know, how, how many times does the Air Force have to go? Ah, we just don't like it. Well, we'll do that job with something else, with guys who aren't trained as much, mm-hmm. and with uh, aircraft that aren't purpose built for it and we're like yeah but what about the 18 year old guy on the ground with a gun how about we give that guy the best that we can Mm -hmm. and so that's there are two different kind of arguments going towards it so that whole treason bird thing comes from a statement a few years ago that in a more recent uh tried to get rid of the a-10 uh effort where uh congress got involved and said no air force you're not getting rid of the a-10 and the general officer lost his job because he got in front of a whole bunch of officers and said all those people who called their congressmen i consider you know i consider that treason and everybody's like whoa come on man Uh, so it it gets it gets kind of ugly at some points but uh but there's a good push and there's a good reason for it and some people like to say well it's it's like the a10 versus the f-35 and i don't think that at all it's not a aircraft versus aircraft thing it's a it's a mission thing right and uh it's it's a fight that just keeps getting fought so like you said right before uh desert storm uh chuck horner was mm-hmm. the, uh, they just had a, I think in the last couple of days, they just had a, a remembrance of the desert, of desert storm. Oh, did they? Okay. And uh, on the Air Force side, they had Chuck Horner there and some other sure. people. Anyways, Chuck Horner was in charge of the air war for right. desert it storm. Right, was the CFAC, I believe. So he showed up to uh, General Schwarzkopf, who was the overall mm-hmm. in charge. Uh, everybody knows that guy. Horner shows up with his plan, and Schwarzkopf goes, I don't see any A-10s here. We're going to have tons of dudes on the ground. What the heck? Schwarzkopf being an army guy, by yes. the way. And he goes, we're going to have armor for them to shoot at, and we're mm-hmm. going to have fights. We're going to have fights between our troops and their troops, and we want guys who have trained to do that, not guys who haven't trained to do that. And Horner was like, yeah, well, we're getting rid of that airplane, like in the next year or something, so no. And Schwarzkopf says, yes, bring him over right now. So they brought him over, and they did really, really good. That that war saved the A-10, by the way. Yeah. They didn't get rid of it. They did get rid of like half of them, but they kept it. And then kind of some words started going around again. All right, these things have overlived their usefulness. And then Kosovo happened, and they did real good there too. The F-117 guy got shot down, and four A-10s escorted some helicopters in right into the same area where an F-117 got shot down to rescue the guy. Um, that's pretty good. That's pretty survivable, you know. Yeah, makes a case for the aircraft. So then it all kind of died down because, unfortunately, we've been at war nonstop pretty much since then. 9-11 mm-hmm. happened just a couple of years after that. So it's it's been going pretty strong. And then the most more recent push was 2013 to 2014. And uh, and that, that, had to, that went all the way up to Congress, and then they stopped them. The secretary of the – not the secretary, the chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, David Goldfing, Fingers – He's the guy in Kosovo who got shot down in the F-16. Oh, he's the chief of staff. He's the chief staff of the Air Force right now. Yeah, his is a great story. Is he He, the one who got hit by AAA? 
Uh, no, come, no. Come, come find me, boys. I used some of that audio the, on one of my bumpers once. He got shot down. I think it was the same ADA commander on the bad guy side that hit the one seven F one seventeen. Hit him too. Oh, well, the guy, guy, the guy had his, the guy has his act together. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, he gets shot down, and I, he was either the the DO, like the XO, or the commander of the squadron mm. flying out of Italy, flying from home. By the way, you're with your wife and kids, I and know, every that's every night you go yeah. in to to fight the war, yeah. and then he gets shot down. Gets picked up right away by Delta Force guys. Nice. And he's checked out medically. And because he's the boss, he leads the strike package the next night. <laughs> so what do you what do you go home and tell your wife? <laughs> Maybe how, you just don't how'd say the anything. war go tonight? Uh, yeah. I'll tell you someday. Yeah, you know, right. I got shot down. Yeah. So the most the more recent push went all the way to Congress uh, to uh, to try to get uh, rid of the A ten, and Congress stopped them. And now, just recently, uh, Goldfein, the chief staff of the Air Force in the last couple of days was just given a speech and said, no, we're going to be flying the A-10s till at least 2030. Wow. Um, Cause they don't, they don't have something that can fill that, that niche role in there. Okay. Um, All right. Let's move on and talk about the variants. What are the different variants of the A-10 and what can you tell me about the different variants? Okay. There were three variants built. Kinda. <laughs> Um, that, right. that, that saw action. Um, right. There was another one, uh, the A-10B, uh, that was, I think they built two of them, and it was a two-seater, and they were, they were trying to see if that would make it easier to do night forward air controller. So it wasn't a trainer idea. It was more no. like a Super Hornet two-seater idea where you have a crew concept. Right. Okay. And they decided, nah. Or Strike Eagle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they decided, now nah, it's going to be expensive and, and not necessary because we're not going super fast and right. and the technology keeps getting better and better so they didn't use that that was the a10b the the first one is the oa10 a and then just the a10a all right and initially a10 squadrons there were two different types of a10 squadrons one was a10s your attack jets and you fly close air support the other squadrons you were all forward air controllers hmm. And they separated the two jets. One was called the OA-10 because anything with an O in front of it is like observation. It's forward right. air controller. And the other one was the A-10. And they treated them like two different jets, but they were the exact same jet. Wow. They just, this tail different number mission. we're going to call it OA-10 right. and this tail number we're going to call an A-10. And so when I got to the A-10, that whole split squadron thing was no longer a thing. They just said, no, they're all A-10 squadrons. Some guys are also going to be qualified to be forward air controllers. Right. But... The A-10A still had a delineation between the OA-10s and the A-10s, even mm -hmm. though they're the same plane. So you might have a squadron and five of your jets are OA-10s and the rest of them are A-10s, but they're all the same jet. It was Probably really weird. Probably because the paperwork would have been too expensive yeah. and laborious to switch it over. Sure. So, so it was just a weird right. ad administrative thing. The third one that saw, though, is uh, middle of last decade. Around 2005, we finally started upgrading the A-10 to glass cockpit, data link, all sorts of stuff. They redid the whole cockpit, which is really nice. Yeah, and right. they redid all the wiring inside and the computers inside to just make it more modern, right. which is good. It, it's kind of good and bad. Well, bad because we're, we consider ourselves and kind of are treated sometimes in the A-10 as the redheaded stepchild of the Air Force. We get some of those upgrades way later than everybody else. And that upgrade right there was 10 to 15 years after everybody else got those same upgrades. Mm -hmm. What's good about that, though, is our weapons officers, our patch wearers, went right to the company and were involved from day one. No, put that switch here. No, put that switch there. Oh, good. And how'd they know what to say? They went to the F-15 guys and they went to the F-16 guys. And I'm sure some of them reached over to the Navy guys yeah, and they awesome. said, hey, we're about to get glass screens and HOTAS, the hands-on throttle and stick and all right. these buttons. What do you guys hate? What <laughs> sucks? What did you think was going to be cool, but turned out not to be good? Mm -hmm. What stuff can't you live without? What is the best? You know, And so they were able to do that. And when I went back to the A-10 in 2012, I had to upgrade from that. So earlier in your career, I'm sure you flew stuff with all round dials. Oh, yes. That's what the A-10 was. All round dials, tiny little green screen off to sure. the side that we could use for Maverick or for targeting pod. But it, it was an effort. Now we got two big color screens. We got it's all integrated. The throttles and the stick and buttons everywhere, and each button goes forward and back, left, right, up and down. And <laughs> and and I was a little bit intimidated. I'm like, oh man, I've been out for you know just under four years, and I gotta get my brain from trainer back to tactical mode. Yeah. 
and all this stuff is new. Oh man. And huh. and then they hand me the sheets for how all those buttons work. And well, they all do something different depending on what mode you're into. You and I'm like, oh man. But I don't know if you can tell talking to me. I'm not super smart, <laughs> but even I was able to figure it out pretty there quick. It go. was very intuitive. They did a yeah. great job. Good. And the experts, you know, the weapons officers, they're they're experts in this and experts in that they 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 get real specific and those those guys did a great job really making making it into a, a, a very very useful piece of machinery and so that was the a10c yes okay and so that's the a10c now if you look inside the a10c cockpit you'll see the two big screens i'm talking about which are really really nice and they're newer than everybody else's stuff oh, cool but if you look at like the avionics like how do i fly from point a to point b that is still all the round dial stuff all our engine instruments are all still the old round dial mm -hmm. needles and stuff and we do that so that if you have some sort of weird computer problem, some software glitch, something like that, guess what? We're still going to war. Yeah. I got a backup switch. I can put a manual reticle up in my HUD and just roll it up and down and you drop bombs and shoot the gun. And what, It's not going to be as quick or as effective, but I can still do it. Right. And, and that's, that's something that's kind of going away nowadays in, in, in more modern jets. That okay. if, you, if you don't have all your systems... Mm, it starts to become harder to do the mission with right. degraded ops. But the A-10C effectively brought the platform up into the 20th century with systems upgrades, performance. Uh, did it get much performance in there at all? No. Okay, so just cockpit, helmet, uh, pods on the external as well, right? Didn't well, the, the, helmet, the helmet didn't come until about... 2012. Okay. So, so you're talking about recently. the, and you flew with Jehemex, right? I didn't actually, but oh, okay. guys, my generation did. I just okay. never did. So we started around 2005, 2006, right when they were doing the A10C upgraded. Mm -hmm. We started getting word from the Strike Eagle guys and from the F16 guys going, hey, you know this Jehemex helmet mounted queuing system? Right. You guys should really think about it because it's awesome. Which is easier said than done because there's a cost involved. Well, sure. And like, what are those helmets? Like two hundred fifty thousand dollars right. or something. It's not crazy. like the pilots are paying for it. But what I mean is, right, acquiring but anything in the training. Mm -hmm. it, uh, in that one, you have to map out the cockpit. You got to do all sorts of weird you stuff. Do, yes. And uh, and so th there's then you got a training program and you got procurement. It's a big it's a big deal. And we looked at it and we're like, that would be awesome to just be able to look at something on the ground press one button on either the throttle or the stick or whatever, somebody will decide what button to press. And then, boom, the targeting pod's looking there. That's right. Because we, I didn't have that when I went to combat. I, I didn't have data link, and I didn't have a helmet or any of that stuff. So if I wanted to look somewhere on the ground, I could type in coordinates for it if somebody knew the coordinates. Or there were all sorts of tricks to make mm -hmm. the pod look where you wanted it to look. Well, that would be really cool to have something... You know, that you just look with no your doubt. helmet and it knows where you're looking and tells the pod to look, the targeting pod to look. That'd be great. The problem with the Jehemex was you can't wear night vision goggles with it. So the A-10, because we're closer mm -hmm. and lower than other aircraft doing this fight, and we're, and we're typically trying to get into a closer fight with, alongside the Army guys, uh, we're very reliant on visual uh, things. Right. And so that's a, that's a showstopper for us. And I know yeah. some of the other platforms, they'll have maybe the flight lead will have the helmet stuff and the wingman will have night vision goggles or vice versa. I don't I, know how they do it. But. I didn't fly with a helmet, like I said, but in the Navy at night, you would sacrifice the helmet for the goggles. The okay. goggles were more valuable. Okay. And as I understand, I think they're working eventually. Maybe the F-35 already has it. I don't know, but they're trying to incorporate so you can have both eventually. That's the F-35. Right yeah, yeah. That it's okay. incorporated it in there. Already? It's really okay. nice. Yeah. So we weren't going to go there because no. they're, they're not going to pay for something like that for the A-10. <laughs> uh, so they started looking at uh, just a like a monocle, like uh, like the helicopter guys wear, yeah. and it's just a little piece of glass that hangs in front of your eye. Then you could swing down night vision goggles right over it and do both. And so they looked again, 2005, 2006 time frame. They looked at you know just a simple little piece of glass with a cross in it, and you could put that on whatever you wanted to look at on the ground and move the pod to look at it. And that's neat. But they were like, well, we're updating the, T the A-10C right now, and it's going to have data link, and it's going to have all this new capability. Let's build it all into the into the into this new helmet-mounted queuing system, mm -hmm. this little reticle in front of your eye. Let's So it was brand new right when I got back to the A-10 okay. in 2012. And this thing's awesome. It just tiny little piece of glass hangs down from your helmet in front of right. your eye. At night, you can put your NVGs on right over Still it. Still use it, yeah. But this little piece of glass in front of your eye, it's full color. You get all the symbology, all the data link symbology, all the, the we don't have a radar, but uh, 
the threat symbology, everything shows up all in different colored right right there in front of your eyes. And it's kind of neat. It's kind of weird flying with NVGs, but also seeing those color things because mm-hmm. everything is green in the night vision right. goggles. But man, is it super cool. Yeah. And it's tied into data link. So now, for example, I could be up in a kill box uh, looking for bad guys. And I could see something out in the distance, like dust or whatever, and I go, hmm, what's that? I could just look there, press one button, my targeting Mm -hmm. pod's looking there. Oh, those look like tanks. I zoom in on the targeting pod, count the wheels on the tanks, double check that, you know, that's not an area where any good guys are. Yeah, those those are bad guy tanks. Then I can shoot a laser out of my targeting pod, and it doesn't blow up the... That's just to get coordinates, right? right, Coordinates in the range. So I shoot at the first two tanks and the last two tanks. And now I got good coordinates for all of those, and I just data link all of them. Nice. So then I get on the radio. So this is 10 seconds after I saw everything, and I get on the radio, and I say, hog flight, call contact on your TAD. That's the tactical display. Right. Data link mark points one through four, sort sequential. We'll be in from the east with JDAMs. And two's ready, three's ready, four's ready that <laughs> quick because they yeah. just look inside at Accept their little it. moving map. Mm-hmm. They move a cursor over to the data link mark point. If they're number two, they're going to take data link mark point number two yeah. and grab it. Boom. Now they're ready to uh, JDAMs. Uh, you guys have talked about those as a GPS oh, yeah. guided bomb. Now they have perfect things. And then I go, hey, for a visual, look heading 236 because the little helmet thing tells you what direction you're looking. And you know, you look outside and you see the little data link symbology laying over your target and we're still 15 miles away that's pretty cool and we just roll in and hit it so it makes things really quick and and very very useful and then the way we can transfer information back and forth between yeah. members of the flight or even outside of the flight um we can get target coordinates from anybody uh hornets could give us target right. coordination or vice versa without even talking to each other you could just zap those points back and forth it's really nice as long as you're in the same net yeah. So big improvements between the A10 Alpha, which was already very effective, and now the A10 Charlie, which is even more effective with all these upgrades. Mm-hmm. Cool. Let's move on to the way it looks. Now, we've already talked about this, but there's one more feature that we really didn't touch on, and that is the wing. And so I think you touched on this already, but it was meant to be relatively slow, yep. loitering in the battlefield. And so that's why the rectangular wing, I would assume, right? Mm-hmm. And it provides what? Good lift, slow yep. speeds? A whole lot of lift at lower speeds mm-hmm. and a lot of real good maneuverability. Uh, I have been, and it's it rattles my mind just thinking back on it, I have been several times, as have a lot of A-10 guys, like in Afghanistan, the big mountains to the northeast. They're really big. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes the weather's bad and the clouds are below the tops of the mountains. And so you are flying through the valleys to get to the good guys to go help them out because the enemy usually doesn't care what the weather is. If they want to attack, they want to, yeah, because they know maybe air support's not going to be there. Well, we, because we're maneuverable, can get down in these stupid mountain valleys. (laughs) And and I say stupid because I just get a little bit scared even thinking about it. the weather closes in, you're kind of trapped, right? And so we'd get down in this upside down triangle. If you can imagine the the Mm -hmm. walls of the valley, you know, going up at an angle and then the clouds are on top. And you don't have a ton of room. And I would always tell my wingman every time, even if they've already flown with me and they hear it, I'd go, hey, we're going to fly on the left side of the valley or on the right side of the valley, but never up the middle. Because when you get to the end and you have to turn around, I don't want you trying to figure out which way to turn. If you're all the way on one side, (laughs) you're going to make it the other way, no matter what. We turn real tight in this airplane. Um, So that's what that big, thick wing is for. Um, Flying slow, good maneuverability. Um, good and stall it is. protection probably as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to armament. Now, we've already talked about the king in this discussion. Sure. Uh, was there anything else on the gun we need to add? I mean, I think No, covered... it's it's awesome. Of yeah. the list of things that I enjoyed flying, you um, know, flying the A-10 most, you know, that that's number one I'm by sure. far. Yeah, I would have loved to have done that. What else does it carry? And I'm assuming just about anything air to surface. I did, did I read correctly? Does it also carry AIM-9 Sidewinder? Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, we have a... I, w- I wouldn't call it a mission that we do mm-hmm. because it's it's not. It's a mission that... Not even a mission. It's a potential thing that we train for. What if we get attacked by a bad guy in the air? What if somebody slipped through the other guys up there? Because this is all a team effort. Sure. Nobody's going up to win a war by themselves. No one aircraft is going right. to go up and win the whole war. So we've got other guys taking care of bad guy aircraft and everything. Well, what if somebody slips through and comes after us? And you have something. Well, 
yeah, I, I want to be able to at least defend myself. So, yeah, like in a combat load in an area where that's a threat, we'd mm -hmm. carry a couple of AIM nines on the out on, sure. out on the wing there. Plus, the gun can be used for air to air. Right. We had an episode on the A7 Corsair II, and it was the same thing. They have a couple fuselage stations for AIM nines. Uh -huh. Ideally, you don't hope to use those, but they're there if you need them. All hey. right. What about for air to surface weapons? Okay, I'll start right here. I said the gun was the number one on my sure. list of things that I thought was the coolest about flying the A-10. <laughs> number two is shooting rockets. Oh, yes. Man, shooting rockets is the best. And rockets have a lot of different warheads. They and do. come in different sizes. Did you guys carry both the 2.75 and the 5-inch No, we carried, we carried the 2.75 inches. Only, okay. At least when I was in, and I haven't heard of anybody carrying sure. the other ones. Typically, what we would fly with for those is Willie Pete rockets for so marking. white phosphorus, and it, because so, it makes a big plume of white. Yep, mm -hmm. and it hits the ground. Apparently, that warhead sounds like a freight train coming in for some reason. Mm. For anybody who's been on the ground for one of those, I, I don't know why. It's Maybe it's not super aerodynamic or something, but okay. then it hits in a huge, huge plume of white smoke, and we can use that for marking targets. Like if you're a forward air controller and you've got a four ship of Hornets up or whatever, and you go, mm -hmm. hey, man, there's my smoke. Right. Right by the river there, that's what I'm talking about. Don't don't put any of your bombs east of that smoke, right. and you're going to be good. Or so, you know, you can use it sure. like that. Mm -hmm. um, the rockets uh, that I always fired, totally unguided. They're point and shoot, man. Right. It's like a video game. It's so awesome. <laughs> you just point and phew, and you get real good at it. I had a chance to do it once, so I, I can understand. And, and they're not super yeah. accurate. If you're pulling on the plane at all, if you're inducing any sort of yaw or any sort of g the rocket comes out of the tube and it's part way out of the tube and the plane starts pulling away and you can tip it off. So if you're pulling back uh, on the stick, the rocket's going to land way short <laughs> or if you're pushing down on the stick. So you kind of have to be nice and stable when you're shooting yeah, it. It has to fare into the wind so, and all that. So, okay. man, you, you get good just by shooting a lot of them. Sure. In Afghanistan, we carried a couple pods of marking rockets, Willie okay. Pete rockets, um, and we used them quite a bit. Um, they can also just be, I mean, honestly, they can be, hey, the bad guys are shooting at us over there. Uh, we don't know exactly where they are. They're somewhere in that tree line. Can you just throw a couple rockets down there maybe that'll shut them up for a little bit and yeah, that because they're low collateral damage as well right yeah you could do right. that pinpoint and not hit the mosque next to it right mm -hmm. let's see they have high explosive rockets yes guns way better than that i'd, I'd mm -hmm. rather have the gun than high explosive rockets there are new rockets though that came on after i left and they're uh, laser guided yep we talked about that on our helicopter episode cool so yep. they are now shooting those in combat i didn't get to do that cool okay so that's rockets uh maverick missile uh the agm 65 right. is something that's been with the hog since since its beginning. Yes. Um, and we had A and B models, old, like crappy TV picture on it. And it was right. okay. But those kind of went by the wayside as they got older and we got better technology. And then they got infrared, the the D. So now you've got an infrared seeker. It works better. Um, and then that got upgraded to the G, which is a bigger warhead and a little bit better seeker logic. Right. Um, and then the the TV ones were replaced with with you know, kind of like digital, going from TV camera to like digital camera, CCD nice. uh, things. And that's the H and K model. And those were great. How about There's, the laser model? Did you guys have that No, one? the Navy went to the laser model okay. early. Like the, like the E, is it the, it's the E or yeah, whatever? It, yeah. Yeah. The echo. And, and, uh, and I got to practice with that when I went back to the A-10 because we finally, okay. like after 2010, finally decided, Hey, maybe that's a good idea. Right. And I think it's way more accurate and way more effective mm -hmm. and i think we should have gone there like the okay. navy did way early uh and there's a newer version of it too but That's fine. uh so there's that and then um the whole array of bombs um pretty much from, anything from a mark 80 series is that fair yes. to say uh so, so i was purpose, in high drag yep so, precision yeah. jdam right laser uh, now the laser J jdam and laser so when we were in afghanistan and this was back in 07 with the a10a with a targeting pod, but old avionics, and we had to like kind of trick the system to uh -huh. even work the pod and everything. We carried two laser guided bombs and one dumb bomb okay. with an airburst, um, and uh, and that was and we drop, man. And if, being an A10 pilot, you drop bombs and shoot the gun almost every flight you're on, <laughs> almost every flight. In operations, you mean? Or in training? Uh, no, I mean in or, training too. Okay. Yeah, every, uh, in Korea a little bit less because there's less ranges. But sure. when you do get to drop, you get to drop a whole bunch and shoot a whole bunch. But yeah, it's what you do, so you get good at it because you just repeat and repeat yeah, and yeah. repeat and repeat. So, so when you go, oh, we're dropping a dumb bomb, cool, I, I can put that dumb bomb right where I would put a laser bomb. Now with the JDAM, that's more, that's better, cool, because I can stay a little bit further away right. and drop those, and, the, sure. and those are really cool. So really the whole slew of bombs and, you know, especially now the new precision weaponry and everything is, is mm -hmm. all available. Sure. 
But things the A-10 doesn't do is, I would hope, any kind of mining, right? Anything for out at sea or dropping no. torpedoes, and we've talked about those on the show. Uh, probably no nukes, because you're not going to do very no well nuke with mission. that. This is a tactical aircraft, not that, strategic. That is somewhere on my list of favorite things about the A-10 is no nukes. Yes. Just because that's a the, quality of life issue. Yes, <laughs> true. And people may not understand that, but all the security stuff and the vaults you have to go to for all the briefs that are behind five levels of get smart oh, yeah. doors and all that. Anyway. Uh, okay. So quite the array of ordnance, but again, all based on the gun. Yes. Okay. And, and again, uh, uh, just to reiterate all, all based on other than some self-defense mm -hmm. with the aim nines and the gun can be used for that too. Uh, all air to ground. That's, that's what the that's mission right. is. Yep. And because you are, as we talked about earlier, low to the ground and relatively slow, Many expendables, right? I want to say like 180 or something. Is that? Oh, that? no. Way, way, more, way more than that. <laughs> um, Here I was being generous. My <laughs> early F-18 had 60. Okay. So what do you guys have? We got uh, four of the, uh, what, how, how big are they? Five by six. I think each canister holds like 30. Okay. And we got four of those on each wingtip, so, plus four of those on each gear pod. <laughs> so yeah, we have a lot. We carried 480 <laughs> flares in oh Afghanistan. All right. You know, if there's if there's like an air to air threat or a radar threat sure. where we want to carry some chaff to, mm -hmm. we're gonna carry like 360 chaff. You know, because they're those double things right. plus another plus another you know 180 or whatever, or whatever it was. Two, yeah, a lot. Yep. It's a lot. Okay, <laughs> and you probably go through them a lot because you're down low, so you put them out preemptively. You put them out reactively. Yeah, it's, uh, um, all right. we have something that other fighters don't have, at least that I know of, and that is a missile warning system. Oh, for a missile being fired. Yeah, at you. so they took right off of like C 130s and yeah. stuff like that who can't really maneuver and stuff. Right. They put they took the seekers right off of those and plopped them on the oh, A ten. And, and you it's, can tell if you're being shot at and from what quadrant. And from what direction. Nice. And we can tie that to our, our oh. self protection stores. So it'll stores. start dumping out flare. So it'll start okay. dumping out chaff or flare or whatever, whatever oh. it it thinks is the best program for you and stuff. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of reliance on that as well. Um, but pr I'm still a big fan of preemptive. Right. As long as you're not giving yourself away. Yeah. How many total weapon stations on the aircraft? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Although three of those are right on the fuselage, and if you use the two, like on the edge of the fuselage, you won't use the middle There's one. Some so really, right. so really ten at every time. Okay. Ten at any ten, time. Ten at any time. And uh, one of those is in a, in a modern uh, battlefield is probably going to have a, an ECM pod for electronic, okay. uh, electronic countermeasures. countermeasures. Sure. If there's any air threat, another one of those is going to have. Probably a couple of AIM-9 uh, air-to-air missiles for self-defense. Right. One of those is going to have a targeting pod now. Uh, nobody's flying without those now, mm -hmm. which I like. Those are yeah, great. No, I'm sure. Um, and then you got the rest, and they'll probably have a couple rocket pods because it's an A-10. You'll probably have a couple of uh, Mavericks. <laughs> a little of everything. And then and then the rest, you put a bunch of bombs or whatever. At night, we carry uh, sometimes – we did in Afghanistan, and we do it training here too – Illumination, battlefield illumination flares. Oh, uh, yeah. Like a Lu-2? That's what we call a Lu -2, it. Yeah. Okay, a Lu-2, yeah. A Lu-2 is like the overt one, the big sure. orange yeah, yeah, flare. Yeah. If you've ever seen, uh, when did it happen? Like 2000 time frame here in Phoenix, the Phoenix Lights. Oh, Everybody yeah. says it's UFOs and everything. It was, right. it was A-10s out of Davis Mountain. The Dropping our, our tactical ranges are just south of the city here. Uh -huh. And so they dropped a whole string of like 10 of them in a row. Uh -huh. And they're just hanging in the sky. And everybody thought UFOs were attacking the city. It was great. Well, to them, it was unidentified. Sure. sure. <laughs> There's a covert version of that, too, okay. that, that we actually, that's the ones we use in Afghanistan. Gotcha. Uh, and then you need NVGs to see it. But uh, uh, those are expensive, so we don't train with those. Right, yeah. Well, I mean, if you can drop the other one, once it opens, it's pretty much sure. the training complete. All right, let's move on to performance. How many Gs, how high, how fast? Oh, man, that's the sore spot. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> well, again, realizing yeah, what it was designed to real, do. Realizing what it was designed for. So the A-10 is not very fast. I think you're not supposed to go faster than 450 or What's something. What's the fastest you've ever seen in it? Uh, probably pretty close to 450. Okay. But I was a functional check flight sure. pilot. Oh, okay. So there's also like a 7.2 max G or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think I came close to that once on an FCF sortie. Well, empty, in other words. Yeah, yeah. Right. And 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 you're supposed to test that much. And yeah, you're right. supposed to get fast and see that all the warning bells come sure. on and all that stuff. But just flying like normal A-10 guy, flying normal missions, I never pulled more than 5.3 Gs. Okay. Um, and probably hung out in the 300 knot range or more, so three to four? N two to three. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so if we're flying around medium altitude orbiting a battlefield, mm -hmm. we'll probably be somewhere between 200 and 250 knots. 
probably closer to 250 knots because you can maneuver better. Right. Um, if we're speed. doing low altitude stuff, now we're going to be t- between 275 and 300. Okay. Um, yeah, not built for speed. And one of the biggest weaknesses of it is it's really underpowered. And a lot of planes are. But the A-10 is all about drag. Uh, it is not sleek. It's <laughs> no. just a round, blunt nose with a gun sticking out of it and all these things hanging, hanging off the off, wings. Yep. And the more lift you create, the more drag you create. Mm-hmm. So we're creating a lot of drag. Right. And the motors themselves are not you know, sleek or anything yep. either. And, and it would be great if there was more thrust to push against all that drag. What that would be good for for the A-10 is eh, it might bump your speeds up a little bit, but okay. not much because right. the aerodynamics are really what where you're getting the yeah. speed. The power is going to help. You know, if I if I roll in and strafe bad guys, but they're shooting back up at me, I want I kind of want to get back up high quick. Right. And it takes a while right okay. now. And if we had better motors, yeah. that would take a lot less time. I don't think motors are ever going to happen. No, probably not. It's been shot down a couple times already. So or <laughs> like that idea has. Yeah. Oh yeah. Gotcha. I'm guessing if you're transiting somewhere, you can get up into the, what, 30s or 40s with a thing, but most... Nope. No? Nope. If we're transiting, we're probably going to be uh, high teens to low 20s. Oh, wow. Even like if you're taking your jets in country? Or... Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. May, yeah. It just doesn't do great. So, okay. It uh, is like in, a big like rectangular in, wing. Yeah. And like in Afghanistan, uh, we'd go up to like 28 if we're out of gas. Because you get up high okay. and you're burning almost no gas, which is great, right. but you're also going really slow. So up there, I might be going doing 200 knots. Okay. When I flew from Alaska back to Korea, well, really Alaska to Japan, and mm-hmm. it took 11.6 hours. Oh, jeez. Well, because we don't have thrust, we can't be very high when we're tanking on gas from you know the big tankers. Right. So we were with a KC-10, which for us stinks. The guy's got a lot of bow wave, and it's hard, hard for us to push through with not a lot of thrust. Mm-hmm. And we were... Between about sixteen and eighteen thousand, all the way across the ocean for eleven plus hours. It's no joke. It's That's not fast, crazy. and it's it's not built to be a plane that. No. Oh, it's a cross country machine. No, no it's not. Right. It's built to do one gotcha. thing, and and everything else it's kind of goes by the wayside. Let's see. So the thrust isn't great. You got a lot of lift. I mentioned a lot of maneuverability. You mm-hmm. can you can really turn tight with terrain if you need to. Right. That is kind of one saving grace if we do get attacked air to air. And it's something that we do train to. We, and sometimes it's just us attacking each other to, sure. hey, how am I going to defend myself right. uh, for long enough for somebody to come in and save me? That's or right. maybe the guy screws up and I can point my nose at him and do something. Um, so every once in a while, we'll get to go fight. And we fought F-16s and I fought Legacy Hornets. I've okay. never fought Strike Eagles. No. We fought the F-5 guys out of Yuma and those guys are really good. Um, yeah. Good cross training with and, uh, uh, different... And the Harriers, those sure. are those are interesting because um, they're kind of like us. It's not a mission that they do. It's something that they practice every once in a while. Mm-hmm. So you get two – it's like two kids who don't know really really know how to fight <laughs> real good, but they both have some squirrely tricks up their sleeve. I'm thinking some expression <laughs> like the dumb leading the blind, but I don't want to <laughs> offend anyone. Something so. about monkeys and gotcha. footballs well, and stuff, yeah. yeah. Let's leave that one. <laughs> what about um, in an F-18 in training – 200 feet is our minimum altitude. In combat, I think probably your answer would be the same thing is do what you have to do, but sure. save your airplane, but save the guys on the ground. Do you guys have a floor you generally train to? Uh, so in training, like the new guys in the A-10, uh, they you know come out to Tucson here, it's 500 feet. Okay. Once they get a little bit of experience under their belt and they're not an idiot or anything. So mo- <laughs> most guys, we try to as quick as we can, get right. them signed down to 300 feet. Okay. And then we can go down to 100 feet once you're more experienced. Okay. And then it's a, a short upgrade with a few rides each just to do that and you have somebody chasing you around. Gotcha. All right, so we're on to strengths and weaknesses. Let's start with strengths, and I, I have to steal it from you. I'm quite certain the gun is a strength. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. um, How about um, on station time? On station time is pretty good, too. It's a good loiter, loiter uh, capability. If, if we were to not have a tanker available, mm. we're, we could probably manage to stay on station for uh, an hour and a half or something that's like that. And that's on station. Right. On average, I'm just trying to think while well, we were out there, and that was flying around all over the country, sometimes close, sometimes far from the base. Uh, my average sortie length was uh, just over four hours, and that's maybe with one air-to-air refueling. Oh, wow. Yeah, my F-18, that would have been with at least three probably. Yeah. Okay. Other strengths... Obviously, now with all the upgrades, the effectiveness as far as the systems interoperability with others. Um, yeah, it's quick. And the various weapons that could be used. I'm sure the troops on the ground love the A-10. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Any other strengths, and then if not, any weaknesses you're willing to admit? For yeah, your baby here? I, I think um, the biggest strength, and, and you know, we, we talked about even some of the system, and the we got some maneuverability, and we got some uh, good offensive capability against the ground. We're very survivable. Um, we have a lot of self defense uh, capability as well. I think the biggest strength, though, is one, it's custom built for that mission, and two. That mission is what we do. Right. So every day, every training mission is that. So when we go to combat and all of a sudden it's a very complex scenario and it's not just the standard, the guy in the ground sounds bored and he reads you a nine line and you <laughs> type in some coordinates and you right. drop a bomb and then you go home. That's not what we train to. We yeah. train to the craziness. And yep. when it's craziness out there, we're ready for it because, you know, I don't have 10 other missions that I have to to be really good at. Right. So some people can consider that a weakness too. Uh, okay, cool. Well, but I think, I think you need to put a plane where it belongs. That's a philosophical discussion, right? It, it because is. Because if it you is. want one airplane that does everything well, it's not, frankly. But, y- y- yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's pluses and minuses for everything. I, yeah. I, I get that. But, uh, you know, if you're like, hey, uh, Russia's got SA-20s that they set up in Iran. Hey, A-10s, <laughs> go take them out. Well, that would just be dumb. It's not right. built for that, you know? Right. Exactly. And the same way something else, hey... There's a troops in contact in the middle of a dust storm. Visibility is about a mile and a half, mm-hmm. and ceilings, you know, are maybe maybe if you're lucky, about a thousand feet. Hey, let's go send the B1 there. That they have their strengths and weaknesses too. That's not one of their strengths. That's right. That's right. Um, but another plane that is built to do that and has done sort that sort of thing in combat. Hey, you know, hey, the A10, you know, right. Um, weaknesses I kind of alluded to sure. a little bit before. Uh, uh, way underpowered. Uh, motors would have been great the various times that they've mm-hmm. that they've said, hey, let's uh, put some motors on this thing, and it keeps, you know, the, that that's not going to happen. Is that, that a relative, like, for example, a weakness you could argue is the fact that you had to fly from Alaska to Japan at 15,000 feet, but that is yeah, a sure. trade-off of the aircraft. Yes. Could the engine weakness have been satisfied by enough money? Like, the technology existed to put, I'm guessing, more powerful engines. Someone just decided not to. Is that I true? I think... In 2004, 2005, that I think is the closest they came to doing it, mm-hmm. and it's the same motor, the just tuned the, up. the GE 34, whatever, just right. tuned up and yeah. newer motors, yeah. and it would end up being like 20 to 25 percent more thrust. Yeah, I mean, that and would so have been there a is a cost, and there's a refit, and there's a test, yeah. and everything. So they just, you know, right. the the people with money decided where that money was going, and it wasn't towards right. that. Well, um, I think our listeners have learned through our 40 plus episodes that. The military equipment isn't always the sparkling new stuff that you see at the air shows and you no. hear about in science and technology magazines. A lot of stuff is, hey, we make do. And the A-10 is a prime example of that. Yeah. yeah. And when okay. what I think what I think is good is, uh, like I said, it's 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 purpose built. Right. Um, and you know, geez, you go, hey, I want I want something that can loiter and be right over the troops' heads, and it's- and hey, what do you know? It's called the A-10. Here you go. That's right. And it means it um, won't be good at everything else that you may right. want an airplane right. to do, and not this one. Right. Awesome. All right. How about notoriety? Where would someone have seen this, either in Hollywood or in the news? I mean, I think everyone, like, in gosh, it's been a long time. I'm probably dating myself. But you remember when Scott O'Grady got shot down, and everybody knew about the F-16? Oh, God. Right? And then yep. you've got Top Gun, so everybody knows about the F-14. Where would people know about the A-10? Stories from the Gulf War. Is that a movie or just in no, general? No, 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 no. Okay. Sorry, just Sorry. just kind of in general. I think I think kind of in general. I think yeah. maybe people saw a little bit of it, but but after the Gulf War, I think a lot more people, mm-hmm. uh, the first Gulf War, people, a lot more people were aware that that plane even existed. Right. So that's in the background. A lot of people don't follow aviation all that much. Sure. Um, so let's see. Um, people listening do, but not the rest yeah. of the world. <laughs> uh, the very first Transformers movie, they oh. had A tens. Um, Very good. Uh, there was like the uh, some weird robot thing that like could dig in and out of the sand, uh-huh. and it, they did like a weird troops in contact, danger close, <laughs> come in and shoot. It was All right. it wasn't the super most. It was Hollywood, yeah, of but course. but it was A ten. We A tens flying around. And we were like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> until like the A tens are flying, like the battle's over. A tens are flying off into the sunset, and one of the pilots goes, uh, "Friendly's in sight." And we're all like, oh, no, that's like the first thing you do, not the last thing you do. Come on. But that's Hollywood. Well, that's okay. So that, that uh, I, 
I don't know. I can't think of too much right. else. No, that's and, uh, okay. And, uh, you guys are like the silent warriors. You get the job done. All right, dude. Well, you have talked about some of your deployments. I'm hoping you've got a good sea story in here somewhere for us. Yeah, I've, well, I mean, my whole sea story is flying over the North Pacific, <laughs> getting gas from a tanker. That was it. At 15,000 feet <laughs> yeah, for 11 like and a half 16, hours? Yeah, All getting right. icing. is horrible. How many uh, pedal packs did you fill? Sorry, uh, a little private. Just one. But... Just one. <laughs> just one? <laughs> yeah. Dude, I made it. I tactical prepped. Tactical dehydration? I prepped. I was all right. All right. How many um, empty peanut butter and jelly bags then? Oh, or something? man. I mean, it was on. horrible. And you know, our young guy in the formation, he's the guy who's supposed to have all the jokes and trivia and everything like that. Well, like two hours into this 11-hour mission, he uh, had a hard time on the tanker and then got yelled at by our flight lead. <laughs> So he clammed and I was up. like, dude, shut up. If he can't get <laughs> gas, you're going to have to divert. And I'm not taking him. You're taking yeah, him up. Yeah. I'll take the rest. Of, anyways, uh, so yeah, he clammed up the whole rest of the flight, uh, so we didn't have that. But You do have autopilot, right? Uh, so we got like an altitude hold oh, for and a heading sense. hold. Yeah, we don't have like dude, a, an well, actual well, then, FMS or anything well, like that. Well, that's good. Then you don't fall asleep, I suppose. Yeah, well, when I went to the job that I'm doing now, all the autopilot stuff, I'm like, whoa, somebody's going to have to show yeah. me how this works. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, no, but that, I mean, that's a sea story. But uh I did a tour in uh, Afghanistan that was a busy year that year. It was 07. Um, there's a bunch of books written about it. Um, the Korngal Valley, uh, especially that year. Restrepo is a video documentary. Some okay. guy embedded with uh, the 82nd Airborne guys, with the 173rd Airborne Bravo or Battle Company, whatever, uh -huh. in the Korngal Valley. These guys got in a firefight every single day for 15 months. Oh, my gosh. That, the guys in World War II didn't do that. Wow. And so uh, this guy made a cool documentary about those guys. And to me, that was supremely interesting because I emptied my whole gun and I, I emptied my whole jet in that valley more than once wow. helping those guys. And it was yeah. really neat to see their perspective of it. There's all of like two seconds of an A-10 flying by and the whole thing, <laughs> but it's not about that. It's about That's those right. guys, yeah. which I think sums up the A-10 community. Yeah, we have our own camaraderie stuff and we have our own fighter pilot traditions and cool stuff like that, like you guys talk about a lot in the podcast. But at the end of the day, and we, we even, you know, deployed, have a sign on the door that said it's about the 18-year-old with a gun. And it's, it's very, uh, and the, the whole community is very, very passionate about that. Um, yeah. It's not about us. It's not about us going out and winning the war. It's not about that. It's that fat staff sergeant, army staff sergeant, who's like holding up the omelet line in the chow hall. <laughs> if he's there tomorrow getting his three egg omelet, holding up the omelet line, you're doing your job. And if that's beneath you, then, then reevaluate your life. That's right. Because those dudes are, you know, getting shot at and stuff and you're, scratching your butt at 20,000 feet in an airplane. It's about those guys on right. the ground. And, and, and that's what I really, really mostly enjoyed about the A-10. Well, you put the serve in service, if you will, a little cheesy, I guess, but I just came up with it. I mean, you guys, like you said, you're not there to make movies and, and flip up your collars and wear mirrored sunglasses. You're there to serve someone else, and it's the young soldier on the ground. Sure. So on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of those guys that you have served, and you being the A-10 community, but you in general, Supa, thank you for that. And thanks for your time today. I think we're just about through everything. The last two questions are, uh, what do you got going now and in the future? And then let's talk about your call sign. So you didn't really talk about the beginning, but you fly for an airline now. Uh -huh. And you retired recently. Yep. And so just hanging out, having a good time. Is it just an airline thing? Or are you doing any anything else? Yeah, I, I retired in May of uh, 17 and went right to uh, flying for the airlines. And uh, I really enjoy it. Cool. It's, so you're home more now than when oh, you used yeah, to deploy? The, the, man, right. the, the, the work rules and the schedule <laughs> that, that sometimes we yeah, hear, now yeah. in this world, we hear guys complaining about our contract and oh, work yeah. rules and blah, blah, blah. Man, it's way better than I was used yeah, to for right. 20 years. So I don't yep. buy into a lot of that stuff. And yeah, it's a lot of home time, which okay. is great. And we moved back to Tucson where we really like it. And uh, and it's been good. And I'm still getting to fly. What do you know? <laughs> Excellent. Good for you, buddy. All right. Well, tell us about SUPA. And you've always spelled it in emails in all caps. So I wonder if this is an acronym or how did you get it? What does it mean, if anything? Or If I spell it in all caps, it's because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it, it could be in all caps. Like it. It's not an acronym. I um, might be mistaken. So I, I my last know. name is Fricky. And uh, there's a singer called Rick James who has a pretty famous song, uh, Super Freak. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like he's saying super freaky. And because he is. 
And anyway, so they played that song at, mm-hmm. at my naming thing, my first tour in Korea when I was a young wingman, because okay. you know you don't get named until you're you're at your that's right you know at your operational unit there. And they played that song and everything, and it stuck. And they're like, ah, super freak. And he died either right before or right oh. after. He died right around somewhere in there. Uh-huh. So uh, I guess it's in memoriam of Rick James. Okay. <laughs> well, and at least on your part, you didn't do anything else dumb to earn something else. So congratulations on that. <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, you have been a wealth of information today. I want to thank you for your time today. I want to thank you for your 20 years of service to our country. Yeah, sure, you and too. freedom-loving people everywhere. And especially bringing great stories and information on the A-10. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. And if anybody listening wants to go be a fighter pilot, A-10's going to be an option, I guess, I guess past 2030. <laughs> so it's there really cool. <laughs> awesome. All right, dude. And thanks very much. And I think we can wrap it up with that then. All right. Thank you. Wow, Jello. Hey, I uh, love the interview with Supa. I especially loved how you guys just droned right into the Gal 8. I mean, that is definitely a... <laughs> That's a crowd pleaser in a good way. <laughs> yeah, well, for some crowds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, on that one, I thought, you know, you know, screw protocol. Let's get right into everybody's favorite. And I've always loved the A-10. And it's just, it's like an ugly duckling. But, man, you can't help but love it because it's so purpose-built and so good at what it's built for. And, you know, it's funny to me that certain parts of the Air Force just hated this thing. And the Congress keeps telling them, no, you're going to keep it and fly it. And it's very effective. It is. I, yeah, I was surprised to learn about the kind of soap opera politics surrounding the Warthog. Yeah. Well, that and I was surprised how ignorant I was to various airspeeds and altitudes, thinking they cruise along like we do up in the 20s and 30s. And can you imagine crossing the ocean at 18,000 feet? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sunshine, tighten us up on the difference between a gun and a cannon, because I did not know and still don't. Yeah, well, uh, so I didn't find any formal doctrine. It's more of a philosophical discussion. But what I kind of gleaned from looking at the different answers on the Internet there is that the uh, gun and the cannon, the discriminator is going to be weight of fire. So let me back up a little bit. Every cannon is a gun, but not every gun is a cannon. So a cannon is a subset of a gun and weight of fire is a discriminator. What I mean by that is the size of the round. So looking back in World War II days, like the uh, F6F, for example, they had 50 cal machine guns. So 50 cal for me, metric in English, let's just just use all metrics. So 50 cal is roughly uh, 12.7 millimeter. So you had 12.7 millimeter guns back in World War II. And then nowadays we have the M61A1, which is a 20 millimeter, and we have the GAL-8, which is obviously the 30 millimeter, right? So there's a fine line, I would say, between the two. But I'd say about 15 millimeters seems like a good discriminator. So if it's less than 15 millimeters... We'll call it a gun, and if it's over, I'll call it a cannon. But once again, that's just my personal interpretation. Sure. Yeah, and uh, to your point, the MiG-29, SU-27, and the Flanker family, they all carry 30-millimeter cannon, I suppose, based on that, instead of the 20-millimeter like we do. And my guess is anything larger than that, you just suffer a little bit of rate of fire. But, man, if you get hit by one of those rounds, that's not going to be a good day. Good night, indeed. So, yeah. Jello, do you want to tighten up uh, the folks at home here on ADA? Ah, very good. Yes, that is Air Defense Artillery. And he mentioned the ADA. I want to say he was talking about an ADA commander, um, somebody on the ground who also shot down. I guess it was the F-16 and the F-117. That is just someone who's in charge of the various air-to-surface, no, surface-to-air weapons that are defending something. So it could be the AAA sites, could be your surface-to-air missiles. It could even be most likely your detection radar and various height finding equipment so yeah that's the guy who's kind of the coach of all that and he's calling the shots and so apparently that one guy must have done his homework (laughs) indeed he did yeah well we will add ada and whatever other terms we came up with into the glossary section on our website as always you can find that at fighterpilotpodcast.com and otherwise we will have a behind the scenes to complement this episode coming out on our YouTube channel in a couple days. We'll make you wait for it. And <laughs> gosh, what else is there, Sunshine? I think that's about it. Do you want to roll with a disclaimer? 
Yeah, we always do. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So Sunshine, instead of telling everybody what's coming next week, we've got this new tradition on Instagram where we're going to have little snippets and pictures of obscure parts of the aircraft to try to build into it. So let's not give away what's coming out on the next episode, but I think everybody knows that it is a pretty prolific fighter. That it is indeed, and uh, yeah, I look forward to the photos on Instagram and the answers. <laughs> Excellent. All right, dude. Well, you have a good week, and we'll see everybody back here next time. What do we always say? Let's get out of here. Let's do it. See ya. <laughs> see ya. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. Thank you.